to take care of themselves while she directs outrageous amounts towards her people with outrageous pay increases and ridiculous created positions for her political connects. Um, Jana Perez comments, Chris, repeat that daily. She's talking about the premium pay um, for essential workers that's uh, allowed under the American Rescue Plan. Uh, Lizzie comments, yep, GovGuam employees were living the life during the pandemic. I lost my job of 11 years. Sorry to hear that. Uh, let's get uh, to the K-Wave News. The Zoom Room here. It's 803 Attorney General Levin Camacho joins the, the show. Good morning, AG. Good morning, Chris. Uh, well, you want to do a little year in review, first of all? 2021, where it's New Year's how Eve. How much time do I got? Uh, take it away. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, the, the last week has been a long year. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I think for all of us. Um, but, you know, this, this this last few weeks, we've actually had a lot of decisions that have come out. I know I was supposed to go on last month and there was some scheduling conflict yeah, yeah. a bunch of things that are wrapping up but i mean just starting from the most recent thing we filed this petition with the superior court to get some a final decision or some finality and put the issue to to bed on the governor's authority to quarantine or to procure quarantine facilities and you've had frequent visitors on your show about that procurement and you know let's let's settle it so we, we filed in court and we'll see where it goes can, can you kind of explain it? Uh, so it's a declaratory judgment, but can you explain, uh, you filed it for, for what exactly now? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I guess talking about year in review and one of the decisions that got very little media attention was a case that was initiated last year, actually in January, this year in January, involving the quarantine of travelers. And again, you've, you've had a lot of people come on when we're quarantining mandatory 10 days, testing out. There were some trial court decisions that you know, we're releasing some people based on things and the governor asked for the superior the supreme court so both the legislature and the governor have a direct vehicle to the supreme court they can completely bypass the trial court and go straight to the top essentially to get important issues resolved and the governor feel, felt as though the quarantine of travelers was one of those issues that needed to be resolved quickly so she filed um, basically arguing she had the authority of the statute as written requires an action to be filed after 10 days in order to quarantine anyone. And, you know, as you know, with COVID start 14 days was the recommended quarantine period. So we were having to file you know, hundreds of cases. Our office was filing hundreds of cases like every week to, pro to continue to quarantine people uh, based on CDC recommendations. And that's what the statute said. Um, we went into the court. At that point, we were representing public health and then the governor's office raised an argument saying that under the Organic Act, which expressly says, subject to the laws of Guam, she can establish quarantine facilities and quarantine stations and operate them. And they believe that that gave her the authority to kind of very broad authority to quarantine in order to prevent the importation of, of disease such as COVID-19. So that was a, a new argument that was raised. At that point, the Supreme Court invited the legislature and our office to participate because we typically will defend the laws. That's our, our job. Um, and in that case, that's exactly what we did. We were on the same side as the legislature defending the statute and arguing that subject to the laws of Guam meant that the governor's authority to quarantine was also subject to our Emergency Health Powers Act. And in May of 2021, the, gov the Supreme Court issued an opinion just saying subject to the laws of Guam, doesn't limit the governor's express authority under our organic act to, to do all these things. So we, we thought, okay, that, that resolved the issue. Um, and then in July, we there was an audit that was put out that said, you know, the governor doesn't have authority to procure, the, the governor doesn't have authority to, to establish these quarantine facilities. And it basically raised this uncertainty over the, the millions of dollars of procurement that I, I believe the number is like 54 million at this point that have been spent on, on quarantining travelers. So we could have issued an opinion. I mean, but let's be real, Chris, some people have already made up their minds on this issue. Um, it's easy to kind of, oh, the government's bad. Everything the government does is bad. They're suspect. And to just knock, knock that out, we just went straight to court and we're trying to get the issue resolved of whether or not the governor has authority under the Organic Act and had authority to establish these quarantine facilities. And two, our Emergency Health Powers Act basically recognized that even an emergency procurement sometimes is not fast enough. And when you look at the audit, even under an emergency procurement, it took five days to procure quarantine facilities after the initial facilities had already been identified. So if you go back to March that weekend when we had our first cases, 
if we had in, kind of went through emergency procurement, we would have had five days of you know, 400 travelers per day from the Philippines coming into Guam and nowhere to put them. And it's also, you know, just interesting going back to that time. Again, it's just the governor had this authority to do these things and people were like, the governor should shut down the airport. The governor should like block us off from travelers. We should do what Palau and FSM are doing. And then, you know, six months later, they're saying the governor is a dictator. The governor is abusing our authority and they would have done all these things. So the reality is we're not going to make people happy with our decisions. That's not our job. Our job is to follow the law, to defend the law and to do what we, we believe is right. So that's, I don't know if that's enough in a nutshell, Chris, to get us up to speed. Right. So uh, with the audit from the public auditor that had the findings about the quarantine that, I, and I know just Senator Frank Blas Jr. was like, hey, are you going to look into this? So depending on the response that you get from the court with this declaratory judgment, does is that going to color how you move forward with anything uh, that the audit found, if you do? If the Supreme, if the Superior Court says the governor doesn't have this authority, then we'll take appropriate action at that point. But even that, Chris, I mean, the, the, the procurement law is very specific. When there's a procurement law violation, there are things that happen. The, you, you can void it, you can ratify it. So the remedies are provided by that statute. And I know there's this idea or this implication that it's a crime to violate the procurement law. And I will tell you, Chris, Many agencies who come on here violate the procurement law, and it's, you know, you're required to record everything. So if you get an email from a vendor, or you get a, you have a communication or a discussion with the vendor and you don't log it, that's a technical violation of the procurement law. And, and I can say, we're not going to put everyone in jail who doesn't know that they're supposed to bring a recorder with them um, every time that they're talking to someone or if they get a question, they're required to document it in some way. So that, that's the other piece that was missing. Um, even assuming there was a procurement law violation, the procurement law provides what happens next. And so you're saying that uh, with the public auditor's audit and the findings that there was, uh, there's an existing remedy and channel to move forward with uh, any violations of procurement. And that would be, are you, are you saying uh, through like the protest process under the OPA? Would be even the, without a protest. Oh, and, and playing, you know, it's, I'm glad you bring that up too, Chris, because no one's protested. <laughs> so, I mean, all of these awards that have been going on, no one's filed any protests for procurement. So, the only thing that's really come out is this audit. Um, but the procurement law says that if something is done in violation of the procurement code, again, I think voiding the the contract or the award is one thing. Ratification is the other, where you basically recognize that you didn't follow the rules, but based on the if there's enough governmental interest. We're just going to kind of okay it on the on the on that side, um, and that's you know been done before. I, I believe some of these like food contracts maybe maybe weren't done right on the front end, but because people aren't going to eat, um, they just need to get done, and so that there's a, a vehicle under the procurement law to recognize that there are emergency situations where you just want to proceed with the contract. Uh, th thanks for that, Ag. Uh, double pay. Yeah. So there was a ruling that came out on on double pay, right? An opinion. Yeah, I mean, again, that's another one where we took, we, we're often, what is the, the shoot the messenger, right? I mean, we kind of, I, w I was in a meeting, Chris, you know, I'm a, back when I was in practice, I was meeting with an attorney and we were talking about our cases and I, I read the law to him. This is what the law says. And he looks at me and he says, well, we can agree to disagree. I'm like, I'm, I'm just reading to you exactly <laughs> what the law says. I don't know yeah. how you can disagree with it. But, you know, when you read through the statute and we've come on and we've taken, I've personally been beat up quite a bit for saying that the law requires, our rules and regs require that in order to get double pay, your facilities have to be closed. And most government, especially the first responders were, and we pointed that out um, under the, that rule, you know, the, the smaller agencies or the more administrative agencies that were closed, if they had staff coming in, they would get double pay, but our hospital our police officers, our fire department, who are not closed during the pandemic would not be in, entitled to that double pay. So we just said, this isn't meant to cover pandemic. There's COVID differential that the governor ended up paying folks based on you know, the, their threat assessment with COVID-19. Um, but that was the position we took, I wanna say in March of last year, that worked its way through the trial court and the Supreme Court last week agreed with us that if you wanna change this, the way it's, it's compensated, you have to go and change the law and have the legislature uh, fix it. And, you know, that's another, you know, gambling is another area, Chris, where um, we, we are glad to, to, to kind of to talk about putting issues to bed. That's been 13 years. It started under Attorney General Limpiaco. Um, we've had 
Pat Mason worked on that, who, who passed away this year, but he was very involved in that. We had our former uh, deputy in civil litigation, Ken Orchid, yeah. Marianne Wallace, who's the assistant AG, who's been handling that. We've been on the opposite ends for many times, but this time we're on the same side. And I, I will tell you that we're unique when I go to these AG meetings. There are only two places in the country where by statute, the AG is not allowed to declare a partisan, um, you know, declare a political party, Guam and the NMI. Wow. And the idea is, the law shouldn't be interpreted based on politics, right? Based on the political party. And in this situation, you've had governors on both sides from Republican to Democrat. You've had legislatures, both from Republican and uh, Democrat, but every AG has had the same position from day one, which is the law says these machines are illegal. That's the end of the story. These rules and regs that showed up at the legislature without any public notice, without any public hearings were void. And 13 years later, we were able to close it out and get it done in a, an issue, uh, an opinion that was issued by the Supreme Court last week. Uh, AG, so what does that mean for these machines? Uh, what types of machines are, are now out the door? Uh, what's the timeline? And uh, I mean, are, are we going to see sledgehammers being taken to these things? Or what, what's going to happen now that the ruling's out? So the Supreme Court does have a vehicle where you can request for rehearing and basically to ask the court to, to reconsider its decision. It's a very high standard and it's rarely done. I mean, it, it does happen so that uh, I like to say it's like, like the dumb and dumber scene where you're, you're saying there's a chance, like one in a hundred, more like one in a million. It's like, so, you know, so you're saying there's a chance, right? Yeah. So it's one of those things where like, yes, there's a chance, um, but it's, it's not very high. So that process will take anywhere from a few weeks to a few months and there will be a judgment or a document issued by the Supreme Court kind of ending the case. At that point, um, you know, we've already started discussions with Reverend Tax. Um, we will have to engage our partners at GPD and to just talk about what the enforcement mechanisms are going to be. Um, I mean, just to be reasonable, there'll have to be a period. I understand there's like 1,200 or 1,300 machines that are impacted by this, this decision. Um, I also do want to clarify that there are laws that have exempted or certain machines are allowed. And for whatever reason, I think we've talked about this, Chris, like yeah. horse racing video games are allowed. Like there's a specific statute just on that type of machine. I'm not sure what the history around that is. So um, they're very narrow, though. There's a very narrow class yeah. of machines that are, are authorized by government yeah. law. And so everything you, else is, is going to be illegal. Right. So when I look at that, it almost, and, and you're right, I don't know the history. I want to look into it, though. It almost seems like it would be like a special interest thing, because why would there be in statute an allowance for, like you said, horse video game racing? I mean, it kind of seems yeah. like maybe party was bringing in these things and they needed something. But that's what I want to say. So the consistency, right? If we've if we've fought for, you know, over a decade to reach this ruling about the Liberty machines, then what does it mean for the other uh, gambling devices? I mean, the intent's the same. It's gambling's gambling, right? Um, these other mm -hmm. devices that are legal under laws, it just, that's it. They're legal and it's the end of the story. That, that's where, we, you know, it's up to our, our legislature to make that policy call. And, and our jobs are to enforce the law. That's what we're doing. We're going in and, and we're, we're, we're gonna execute and enforce to our ability, but that's gonna require a change of statute. Uh, what about the CCU lawsuit uh, resolution, AG? Yeah, that was, um, you know, we, we, that was the first thing time, I think, in, in quite a while that our office had taken action and, and to enforce. Uh, this goes back to these raises that were given in executive session that are clearly in violation of the law. We filed suit. Um, we got, I believe, a $10,000 settlement. And one of the things that we really wanted to stress is, you know, our, our direct service providers for, for people who are struggling with addiction. And we hear stories that getting an ID is a barrier to recovery because you can't get a job without an ID. Um, driver's education is another barrier where if I can't get, take driver's ed, I can't get a driver's license, I can't go to work. So what we've, what we've the, through the, those funds are gonna be used, uh, dedicated to our service providers because power bills, believe it or not, are another one of those areas that we've, we've heard stories of folks who qualify for housing aftercare after they've completed some of these treatment programs but they have a $200 outstanding power bill and that disqualifies them completely from these housing programs. So we said, you know, $200 and we potentially are gonna help someone on the road to recovery. So we're gonna use, you know, all of that money is gonna be used and, and given back to our direct service providers to help those who might have outstanding utility bills so they can get into these programs and get their life started again. Can you give us an example of uh, what, what type of organization is a, a direct service provider? Sure, uh, Lighthouse Recovery Center is one that we, we have actually entered into an MOU with, as well as Oasis Center. They're, 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 the, they're the two uh, primary ones that we've worked with. 
um, we talked about th these, the first settlement we received about 275,000, a hundred thousand of that went to Guam Behavioral. And uh, I think Teresa Ariola was on, she was saying that we've actually entered and that those funds are going to be used to hire two counselors with our RSEP program of the DOC. So, you know, we're, we're making sure that money is getting to, to where it needs to be. Um, and that was a law that was actually just passed, I think last week, again, it's, it's been a long year you know, going back to last week, but the governor signed this opioid trust fund into law and it makes sure all, you know, we've secured upwards of $14 million that are going to be coming in to fight our addiction issues. And all that money is going to be put in the trust fund and they're going to have people, uh, subject matter experts that are going to kind of decide the best way to use those funds. Right. AG, could we just real quick go back to the uh, gaming uh, devices things? We had a comment here. Bottom sure. line, uh, it's from Yabbit. Bottom line is the game rooms are still open. Now, just for, for clarity, this decision doesn't affect whether or not game rooms can exist on Guam. They can be open as long as inside those game rooms, the gambling devices that they have are legally allowed. Is that That's accurate? correct. If, if, the, if, if, the, if there are statutes that authorize specific machines and those machines are operational, I mean, that, that that's not, you have to go back and change the law. That, that's the only recourse. Um, and then also, I mean, I know it wasn't on the list, AG, but the uh, MOUs, I know that there's a few MOUs that we're hearing from the mayors that are, are with you and then with the ESF, the Education Stabilization uh, Funds. Can you just kind of give us a round robin on, on any MOUs? Yeah, uh, you know, Chris, we, we, we deal with every year anywhere between 300 to 400 contracts um, and MOUs. And for the most part, when everything's done on the front end, it moves quickly, you know, a week or two for us to sign. Um, I, the ones that you're referencing, my understanding is that they've all been issued at this point, or we, we've approved them and we're just waiting for finalization. So I, 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 that's the last information that I have. If I'm wrong, contact us, let us know. Um, I know that there was, the, the mayors had an MOU for, for the, those funds. And then there was also this thing about the abandoned vehicles. And yeah. I got a text message at 530 in the morning saying, what's going on? How come you guys are sitting on these documents? And you know, of course, it's a little bit more complicated because we do have a, a law um, and I believe Angel Saban was on and he's very familiar with the issue and he just pointed out like the way the, the law, that's another area where the law has to change where there, there are all the, there's all this bureaucracy um, and how to get rid of an abandoned vehicle where you have to impound, take to an impound lot, rather than tax, has to send certified mail to the last registered owner. They have 10 days to reclaim. If they don't reclaim and the value is above a certain amount, you have to do an auction. <laughs> I mean, it's extremely, extremely complex for a problem that we all know exists in Guam and needs to be resolved. So that's another area where we've kind of said, hey, here's a law. We want to make sure that when you guys go out and have this program, that's only for abandoned vehicles on public roadways and public easements, that you're kind of following the process or, you know, go back to the, you know, have, see someone at the legislature who might be willing to streamline the process a bit to just help us address that issue. So with the abandoned uh, vehicle one, um, has that one been uh, completed and sent on or is it still? In I, I, I know that we're, it's, under review and it's getting close to my understanding. I think there's needed some additional clarification on, on whether or not the, you know, the some assurances that, that the, the law is going to be complied with for those particular circumstances. And then for the uh, education stabilization uh, fund grants that has already been sent on to. Whoever. My understanding is most of those, if not all of them have been, um, I mean, I, I don't have the big stack on my desk every day. My kids tease me that all I do is just sign documents, but I, <laughs> we had huge boxes in there. Um, we'll follow up, but if, if folks are are waiting the, for them, I will. Our agencies, I believe, have been working with the governor's office directly on that. You know, we, we've been in contact with them. Uh, can we move on to prosecution stuff? Uh, I don't know if we had got a comment from you about the uh, indictment of the former uh, DOC deputy uh, director Joey Terlahi, also the son of the current public safety uh, chair. So that's about all I can tell you at this point, Chris. And that the hearing is set for next week. Uh, there, there is a arraignment, I believe, scheduled for January fifth. I can confirm that the case was filed and, uh, and it's moving forward. Uh, what about uh, some of the uh, convictions that you've uh, got? Uh, I mean, you know, pretty recently and some, some pretty disturbing, disgusting, high profile criminal sexual conduct cases. Yeah. Our, our prosecution division has, has been extremely busy. And again, going back to January of this year, um, it's, this is a still tough this month and we have Omicron and I'm, I'm just hoping that things stay steady but in December this time last year we had hundreds of cases that we had a grand jury and our prosecution division really made a huge push to clear 
because we weren't having grand juries based on our, our shutdown with Delta, the initial surge. So they've done a fantastic job clearing those out. We had a, a bunch of trials in January, February. Um, we've had some very serious ones. I think you're referring to this, this uh, criminal sexual conduct case that there was a conviction on earlier this week. And I mean, we're just extremely proud of our office. I think Assistant AG Brown, Sean Brown handled that one. Assistant AG Christine Tenorio is in a case right now that's, you know, very public. I mean, it's tough. These are tough cases to prosecute, but that's our job is not to get convictions, is to seek justice. And we have these victims who are coming forward and, and are going to get their day in court. Man, AG, we're, we're uh, glad to be part of that. As, as we uh, approach the new year, I was kind of just doing a little rough Google on uh, some of the big cases uh, for this year, you know, and, and we started the year in January with that uh, beheading, drug related beheading. Um, right. Uh, and it's just been it's been a pretty crazy year crime wise. So are, what what uh, trials are slated to happen in the uh, upcoming uh, 2022 year that yeah. that your office is kind of really working hard to prep for? Well, that's the other thing, too, Chris. People don't realize that we, we have an extremely high conviction rate for homicides in our office. I know that the the, the ones that went to trial this year, there, there was at least three or four off the top of my head. I'm not going to name them because I might get the names wrong. And the, the people, the parties that I'm aware of. But if you go back through the stories this year, I, I believe the Acosta uh, murder trial was, was earlier this year. We got a conviction. Um, there was another uh, murder that happened in NCS where we got a conviction. I believe there's a trial scheduled for the Kumatak um, incident that's scheduled for in a few weeks. That's going to start up. So, you know, we, we GPD has been, Chief, I know has been on quite a bit too to talk about the advances they've made. I can tell you I've sat in with the briefings on some of the cases we've charged out and they've been doing a fantastic job on their side investigating these crimes. And it comes down to prioritizing. You know, we're going to prioritize violent crimes um, in particular. Rapes are going to be prioritized. Um, and, and that's kind of the direction that uh, under the, the leadership of Chief Prosecutor Basil Amalan that we're taking. So you're going to see more of those types of trials, Chris. Um, and connect them. It is an unfortunate thing, but we take those seriously. Uh, before I let you go, well, is there anything on your end that you want to bring up before my last question? Uh, well, you know, we had we started with that um, this year. We had our Supreme Court victory, and I know, <laughs> and then that's going to start up again. We just received word that we have a new judge. There's a hearing scheduled in January, and, and we'll we'll probably have a, a more detailed update for you on that. But that's just another you know, in line with our our push for environmental issues, environmental litigation, and you know, I'll. I'll probably set up something in a week or two just to talk about a case that we have cooking right now um, that I know that you'll be interested in, in learning about some of the, the discoveries we've made over the last few weeks in our Consumer Protection Division. Well, that sounds good, uh, AG. So just going back to what you talked about, uh, partisan and uh, politics and uh, 2022, that's an election year for Attorney General, right? Is, is it? Is it? Uh, I don't know. Is I it? Haven't uh, my, I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't checked my. I haven't checked my. I got to check my calendar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to have any mini hatch violations. Yeah, yeah. No, but I, I mean, I, the election commission. Am I allowed to ask you if you're seeking re-election or? You're. You know, we're we're focused on the work here, and I'm focused <laughs> on my staff. And uh, you know, if and when that announcement's made, we'll, we'll be sure to let you know as well, Chris. Okay. Well, but thanks. Thank you for asking. And right on. Happy New Year to you. You know, wouldn't be me if I didn't ask. So appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Well, happy New Year, AG. Thank you. Happy New Year. And please party responsibly. Celebrate responsibly. Don't shoot your gun in the air. Don't drink and drive. Please. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you, guys. Right, right on. Attorney General uh, leaving Camacho um, there. 825. Good talk. It's Thursday, December 30th, 2021. Pacific Points, Cabo Enterprises, it and Jack in the Box. Proud to present this episode of The Link. We got to take a quick break. And we're coming back with our 8 o'clock newscast. Good morning. We have the world at our fingertips. Inspiration in our tech. Get the job done the right way by getting the right stuff at East West Rental Center. With years of experience helping builders, we definitely got what you need. Call 646-1463 or visit us in Upper Tumon. Open Monday to Saturday from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. and on Sundays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The relationship between Guam and Manila, Philippines is undeniable as we share similar cultural traditions, history, and heritage. With generations of Filipinos calling Guam